Yes, okay. Thank you. I think I'll take the next session forward. And uh, we have a very interesting session right now outline. And we've got three wonderful speakers who are going to talk to us about you know, different topics. And uh, we've got Dr. Lezik, we've got Dr. Kamlesh Kunti and Dr. Sudeep Rudar, who's going to be addressing us lectures in this, uh, in this symposium. And our first lecture starts with Dr. Lezik, who's going to uh, give us a talk on responders and non-responders to SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 uh, RA, possible mechanisms and opportunities. Uh, just to introduce Dr. Lezik, he is a specialist in internal medicine, specialized in the diabetology and is the head of the department of diabetes and internal disease at the Medical University of Warsaw. He graduated from the Medical University of Florida. In 1994, he held foreign training and scientific internships at Oxford, London and Wakefield uh, Masters uh, in the Netherlands and Miami, USA. In his clinical practice, he focuses on the diagnosis of carbohydrate tolerance disorders and treatment of type 1 diabetes, type 2, results, it seems to have worked. Uh, diabetes accompanying other diseases and complications of chronic diabetes, primarily in circulatory system, nervous system, eye organs, digestive system, kidneys, and particular attention is devoted to the use of oral agents and insulin. He was a director of the ESD postgraduate course. So we, I think we'll all be love to hearing uh, Dr. Lezik on his talk. So over to you, Dr. Lezik. Uh, yes. Hello. It's a great pleasure to be again with you and to be part of Diabetes India. And I will try briefly mm, to present the topic for of pretty high, uh, I mean, quite quite important nowadays and something which we've seen very recently uh, using all the new drugs. Let me start to share my screen. I hope you can see it. Although I, I do have, hold on. Maybe I will It's my first slide. Oh, you can see it now more or less correctly. I'm not sure I cannot go into presentation mode. Once again. Just stay with me for one more moment. Yeah, perhaps now it will be okay, sorry. Uh, sir, may I share your recorded uh, video? 
Yeah, I think, uh, hold on a moment, I, something's wrong with my computer, but perhaps in a moment, uh, let me try once again. It's yeah, coming, can sir. You see, yes, can you yes. see it now? Yes, perfect. Okay. So it's a, it's a, the question I want to, to describe and try to um, reply to it. Why we see patients who are responding very well and not responding really to SGLT2 and GLP-1 receptor agonists. GLP-1 receptor agonists are really changing the way we treat diabetes worldwide, more in more advanced and richer countries, less in countries who are still struggling. But nevertheless, they started to be used in any country with patients with diabetes. And as we know, the action is very multiple, is compound, and GLP-1 receptor agonists uh, affect uh, almost any tissue in our body. Eventually, they lead to glucose uh, reduction, weight reduction, appetite reduction, which is very important, and cardiovascular protection. On the other hand, SGLT2 inhibitors have also a very multiple effects on the body. However, their mode of action is very simple. GLP-1 receptor agonists, as the name says, they stimulate receptors. Uh, however, SGLT2s and the receptors for GLP-1 are all over the body, while SGLT2 inhibitors, they just uh, make us lose glucose. But this simple thing uh, entails, uh, initiates number of metabolic changes in the body, which eventually help the heart, as in this picture, but also the kidneys, and they are also very powerful cardioprotective agents. But why some patients lose less weight than the others on GLP receptor agonists? Why we see greater reduction in glucose in some patients and not in the others? Uh, that is still uh, unclear and it's frustrating because some patients expect excellent results from these drugs, both in terms of glucose reduction, weight control, while it doesn't happen. And this is awkward both for the patient and for us as doctors. So if you look at appetite regulation, at, at uh, food intake regulation, uh, if you look here on the left of this picture, our appetite is basically regulated by two systems. One is homeostatic regulation, just to maintain the body weight, maintain all the systems working normally. And there is another system which is responsible for pleasure associated with eating, and the system of rewards, you can call it hedonic systems. And they are regulated by the signals coming from the fat stores, from various hormones, uh, also related to emotions, smell, what we see, etc., etc. Pretty complicated stuff. And in people with obesity, this hedonic system is somehow oh, has overridden any other systems. It's uh, took the control of the food intake uh, and people just cannot control this system themselves. GLP-1s apparently reverse that and they are able to restore more stable regulation of uh, food intake and glucose uh, metabolism. We have multiple GLP-1 receptor agonists on the market. Here you can see all of them in uh, injectable form. And the first one was exanatide on the left, and then we developed to the yeah. right-hand part of this picture. And now we are mostly use one weekly medications, which is semaglutide, dulaglutide. But we have also fixed combinations of long-acting insulin analogs. They are not widely available, pretty expensive, but we are moving into this direction. We, so we we learn quickly uh, that uh, these drugs lead to weight loss. Mm, here, one of the first studies with the raglutide used for obesity with a dose of three milligrams. And the patients, as you can see, at the highest dose could lose uh, as much as 12 kilograms of body weight, which is an excellent result. But the real breakthrough, and this is what is really happening in Europe and the US, is the arrival of semaglutide, which is able to make people with diabetes lose 
over 10 kilos of body weight at a higher dose, 2.4 milligrams, still uh, keeping HbA1c at 6.5 and not going too low. Mm, and uh, we also learned that in uh, sheer obesity without diabetes, semaglutide may lead to even 17, 16, 17 kilograms of body weight within a year. And this weight loss is stable. Uh, nothing really happens here. Uh, and the drug is basically well tolerated, just nausea, very rarely vomiting. So we suddenly received the drug, which is very successful in treatment of obesity and type 2 diabetes. However, the difference in response is really pretty wide. Last year, almost uh, almost a year ago, FDA licensed semaglutide at the dose of 2.4 milligrams to treat obesity, as we all know. But the breakthroughs are really ahead of us. Just three weeks ago, we saw the results of a sermon study with terzepatide, which is a dual double agonist, GIP and GAP1 receptors agonists. And here you can see on the right of this figure that the patients within a year may lose almost 24 kilograms of body weight, still with pretty good tolerance. So this is an amazing stuff, amazing results, still large variety in response. And this is shown here. This is the study comparing dulaglutide and semaglutide. And the figure in the bottom left-hand corner shows different reaction uh, with the body weight on these drugs. We can see that semaglutide of one milligram uh, uh, led to the greatest weight loss, while dulaglutide 07.5 to a smaller and dulaglutide 1.5 also smaller. But if we look here, which is semaglutide, if we look at glucose levels, for example, look at fasting plasma glucose, which is on the left-hand side at the top, we can see that some of those curves with different doses of sema and dulaglutide are superimposable. So probably the differences we see between the drugs is about the dose. This is one thing. Hormones, we frequently do not know what's the maximum dose of the hormones. We started with both dulaglutide, semaglutide at lower doses. Now we are got to three, uh, 2.4 milligrams with semaglutide and uh, 4.5 milligrams of dulaglutide we can use for either obesity or diabetes. But if we think about insulin, insulin has no maximum dose. If we look in the, the books, uh, pharmacology books, there is no maximum dose of insulin. The insulin must be as given at the dose where the glucose level is correct. And this variability is pretty clear. If we look at this figure, which was published by Michael Nauck, number one name in Incretin studies, uh, the, this is the relationship between the variability, this is coefficient of variation, in HbA1c reduction and weight reduction. And if you look at the top line here, which is albiglutide, this is the drug where variability in body weight reduction is really high, smaller with HbA1c, and the most stable in terms of HbA1c and body weight reduction variability is semaglutide. However, they are different in the case of most of the drugs. So it's more, the drugs are more predictable in terms of lowering glucose, less predictable in terms of lowering body weight. And that's no wonder, because if we, if we look at any new drugs which regulate weight loss or glucose for that matter, we may see some average reduction as shown here at minus 5% of weight loss. But moving left side or right hand side or left hand side, we will see greater or smaller response to the drug. This is how drugs work. This is the biology of pharmacotherapy. And that's this being able to predict how much patients will lose weight or how much their HbA1c will improve is important. These, these figures show the relationship between HbA1c reduction and cardiovascular risk reduction. And in the top left hand corner, we can see the figure with HbA1c. The greater HbA1c reduction, the greater reduction in MACE risk. So it is important to know which patients will benefit from these drugs in glucose lowering, because then we may improve their cardiovascular risk. And if you look on the other side, in the, in the opposite corner of this figure, in the bottom right-hand corner, here is the relation between HbA1c and heart failure. And here we see that no matter what reduction of HbA1c, the drugs have similar effect on heart failure. So this cardiovascular risk reduction effect is uh, largely independent of glucose lowering. So pretty exciting stuff in terms of clinical decisions. 
and uh, what we mm, can offer uh, to the patients and how we should explain these drugs to them. Uh, to make things even more complicated, because I'm just basically signaling the issues which are ahead of us, these are, this is also from the paper by Matt Michael now. Look what he find, what he, how he summarized the findings uh, regarding energy expenditure. Uh, if patients are losing weight by calorie restriction, then energy expenditure is also reduced. But if we use GLP-1 receptor, which is not very good for weight loss because the body starts to save energy instead of spending it more. However, GLP-1 receptor agonists, the body also starts to save energy, but then this energy expenditure goes back to the normal level. So that's one of the reasons why it's easier to lose weight on GLP-1 receptor agonists than just by calorie restriction. So finally, what might be the mechanism? I have only 20 minutes and the session is already delayed, so I, can, I don't have time to elaborate on it more. But just a few ideas why, what could be possible mechanisms for non-responding to GLP-1 receptor agonists or SGLT2s. One, and that's been proven, it's genetic polymorphism within the GLP-1 receptor. So that's one pretty simple reason to understand. Then patients may have adaptation to basal metabolic rate at different rate. There might be varied cardio mm, uh, central nervous system response to hypothalamus stimulation uh, of uh, appetite reduction. Uh, we see patients who are early and late responders. Some people, they, uh, they see the reduction in glucose control uh, in glucose and weight pretty suddenly in the first couple of weeks when the drug has started. Some of them have to take it for a month or two. That's an interesting thing, why it happens. That should also help us to decide whether we should intensify the treatment or not in some of the patients or just wait. Then there is an issue of duration of obesity, of history of obesity. The longer someone is obese, the more difficult it is for him to reduce the weight. And also the motivation for lifestyle modification. Some patients take GLP receptor agonists or SGLT2s and think, okay, I'm starting to lose weight. That We have a saying in Polish, it gives me wings, and I start to do more, to lose even more. Other patients say, okay, I'm losing weight on the drugs. I don't have to change my lifestyle anymore because the drugs do it for me. So that also requires some attention when we talk to the patients with the drugs. With SGLT2 inhibitors, the issue is probably simpler. One thing which we know which happens with SGLT2s are the compensatory hyperphagia. So that patient probably could control and then may get better metabolic results. Also adaptation in basal metabolic rate may vary between the patients. And as I said at the beginning, this uh, glucose loss with urine uh, causes multiple hormonal changes in the body, which we are still learning to understand. So what clinical questions we have yet unanswered? We should be able, I guess it will happen in the next couple of years, to successfully identify patients who are early late on non-responders to the drugs. The variability is quite wide. In some of the drugs, really high, and in some of them smaller, like semaglutide. So we need data, we need analysis, which will show for which patient these drugs, which are still expensive, even if you're reimbursed, will be particularly successful. We should be able to know uh, in, who, in which patients we should intensify, intensify therapy early because we see no response and there are non-responders or they are rather late responders and we should just wait because the drug will bring the results but a little bit later. Then the last question, also very important, combination therapy, SGLT2s and GLP1s together in what sequence, which drug should be first, in whom pay, in which patients. Also area in which we will have little evidence, I believe, but we have to use our clinical judgment to make uh, the best decisions for the patients. And there are, of course, many more questions arriving. So thank you very much for your attention. I just wanted to briefly signalize, present some dilemmas we have with new drugs, and let's hope uh, next month's couple of years will bring the answers to them for the benefits of our patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Then you are.
Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Lilzik. And do we have any questions for uh, Dr. Lilzik? I don't see any question. So thank you very much, Dr. Lilzik. I think we've had an excellent discussion and uh, very obliged for uh, such a nice talk that you've given us. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker for the evening is going to be Dr. Kamlesh Kunti. And Dr. Kamlesh Kunti is going to talk to us about diabetes and multimorbidity. He needs very little introduction because I think most of us have heard him on such wonderful occasions and he's given some excellent talks. Uh, Dr. Kamlesh Kunti is from Diabetes Research Center from Leicester, UK. He's a professor of primary care diabetes and vascular medicine at the University of Leicester. He has led a program of work during COVID-19 pandemic and is a member of UK government's scientific advisory group for emergencies and chair of the SAGE Ethnicity Subpanel. He's also the director of the UK National Institute of Health Research in Applied Research Collaborations, East Midlands, Director of Center for Ethnic Health Research and Director of the Real World Evidence Unit. He has published more than 1,100 peer-reviewed articles and is also the Honorary Visiting Professoral Fellow with Department of General Practice, University of Melbourne. He is named as top uh, 20 diabetes researchers globally by Expert Scale, and he has won numerous awards nationally and internationally, including the Sardar Vallabhbhai Patel Award for Excellence in Medical Research in India. Primary Care Diabetes Society Lifetime Achievement Award, Diabetes Philips, uh, Philippines Augusto de uh, Lituna Endowed Lecture Award, and Primary Care Diabetes Europe All Chrome Award. He was awarded the CBE in 2022, New Year's in the Honours List for Services to Health. So, may I hand over the podium to Dr. Kamdish Kunti for his lecture. This meeting is being recorded. Hello, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Brunsi and the team for the kind invitation. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person. Today, I'm going to be talking about type 2 diabetes and multimorbidity. This is probably the future of diabetes management. So the next few minutes, I'd like to talk you through the epidemiology of multimorbidity type 2 diabetes and how multimorbidity affects people with type 2 diabetes. And I think it's still topical because COVID hasn't gone. So um, talking through about COVID and impact in people with multimorbidity. Um, some uh, highlights on management because uh, of the brief nature of this presentation and then a summary. In terms of the epidemiology, why is uh, multimorbidity important? Uh, well, first of all, the Definition of multimorbidity is the presence of two or more long-term conditions. And the reason it's important is because living with multiple long-term conditions is going to be the norm rather than the exception for most people. It is also associated with poor quality of life, more hospital admissions and higher mortality. And although uh, currently health services are largely organized to provide uh, care for people with single diseases. I think we need to start thinking about how we uh, reinvent our uh, services to manage people with multiple long-term conditions. This is a really nice iconic slide uh, of data from the whole of Scotland uh, published in 2012 and looking at the number of people who have uh, different long-term conditions um, by age groups at the bottom and a portion of patients on the y-axis. And what we see is people with two or more conditions increases really from the age of around uh, 30 to 40. But if we look at a uh, proportion of people having five or more conditions, that's uh, huge numbers uh, from the age of around 60. And people are living longer, and that's why they have a, a number of different conditions. This is a work that we conducted uh, looking at data from half a million people in the UK Biobank. Uh, 
And here we look at the proportion of people having different multiple long-term conditions. Now, this is probably not a representative sample, but it tells you the number of conditions people have. Uh, the commonest uh, conditions in this study were hypertension, asthma, cancer, depression, diabetes, and then uh, some of the cardiovascular complications. In this study, diabetes was prevalent in about 45% uh, of the population. But these were a younger group. These were participants aged only between 40 and 69 years of age. And they looked at 36 commonest conditions here. Um, this study showed that 19% had more, more than two conditions. To, and we did some clustering analysis. Uh, in the first cluster only included myocardial infarction and angina. Second cluster had 26 conditions and diabetes was the epicenter of these uh, conditions and uh, strongly associated with heart failure, CKD, liver failure, and stroke. And the third cluster had high, eight highly prevalent conditions, including cancer, hypertension, asthma, and depression. And uh, in terms of the number of studies that have been uh, published on multimorbidity, it's huge. This is a systematic review we've just recently conducted. And uh, here we looked at uh, 566 studies. What we see here is the different conditions, the prevalence of different conditions that they've been grouped together uh, by cardiovascular disease, metabolic conditions, respiratory conditions, musculoskeletal, mental health, cancer, and then whole raft of other conditions. What we see here is the commonest conditions grouped together that are present in most of these studies is cardiovascular disease, about 98% and metabolic and endocrine disease, about 97%. So you can see cardiometabolic conditions as the commonest uh, uh, multimorbid conditions uh, that are prevalent at population level. The others are, are obviously cancer and uh, respiratory conditions and musculoskeletal conditions. And this is the, the study I mentioned about the diabetes being at the epicenter of all the conditions. As you can see, all these conditions are linked uh, via diabetes, either through direct uh, associations or indirect uh, associations, what we call discordant or concordant multiple long-term conditions. And obviously, concordant are, are uh, in people with diabetes, uh, things such as liver failure, uh, cardiovascular disease, etc. And discordant are things like um, uh, osteoarthritis, um, anemia, schizophrenia, etc. We also know that people who are deprived and live in more deprived conditions have a lot more conditions. Um, they, they get them uh, 10 years earlier than people living in the most affluent uh, areas. And you can see this again from this uh, Scottish data, that these seem to increase from the age of around uh, 30 to 40 years of age as well. We also know that mental health problems are strongly associated with the number of physical conditions that people have. So um, we know diabetes is uh, strongly associated with mental health conditions. About 18% of people with diabetes have uh, depression. And this is in part related to the number of multiple long-term conditions that people with diabetes have. Uh, as you can see, the proportion of people with mental health problems in here, if they only have one condition, about 20% will have mental health conditions. If they have five or more conditions, around 60% of people will have mental health conditions. And again, it's worse in people who are more deprived compared to people who are more affluent. So what about type 2 diabetes and multiple long-term conditions? And this is a really nice uh, study, and I use this slide a lot because it clearly tells you the proportion of people with diabetes who have other conditions. So if you look at the, the highlighted area, overall this study is telling us 17% of people with diabetes will not have any other conditions, so they only have diabetes. So that's telling us 83% will have other multiple long-term conditions. If people are aged less than 65, they will have diabetes and three additional conditions. If they're aged more than 65, they will have diabetes and 6.5 
other conditions. So diabetes is a multimorbid uh, condition. And the, the conditions that they have are uh, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, heart failure, stroke, atrial fibrillation, COPD, arthritic conditions, and as you can see, uh, depression as well. The other issue with uh, having multiple long-term conditions is that they come and see uh, healthcare professionals more regularly. And obviously they cost a lot more to society and if they're paying themselves to themselves. This is uh, data we looked at from the CPRD, the UK database. And what the, uh, this tells us is, uh, first of all, the proportion of people who have just diabetes uh, or they have diabetes and one condition, diabetes and two conditions, or diabetes and three conditions on the red at the top, at the bottom in the blue is just diabetes. Uh, and if we look at the consultation rates, people who only have one comorbidity, uh, diabetes, for example, they only have about 12 consultations per year. This is not just for diabetes, but for many other conditions, because as you know, primary care is the first point of contact in the UK. If they have uh, two conditions, uh, they have about uh, 15 contacts per year with a healthcare professional. That includes nurses, doctors, and pharmacists in the general practice. And if they have three or more conditions, then they attend about uh, 18 times uh, or have a contact 18 times. On, and on the right-hand side, you can see the cost per year. This is just for consultations. Um, that it varies from people without multimorbidity uh, or any chronic condition costing about 400 pounds per year uh, because they come about 10 times a year compared to those who have more than three core morbidities. Uh, it's uh, nearly double uh, the cost uh, for uh, attending on a regular basis. What about cardiometabolic multimorbidity? Well, this is a really nice study from the Emerging Risk Factor Collaboration. And what this is telling you, if we start at the bottom, uh, compared to a reference group who don't have any chronic conditions, people with diabetes, stroke, or myocardial infarction, their risk uh, of uh, mortality is about twofold higher. If they have two conditions, diabetes and MI, diabetes and stroke, or stroke and MI, there is uh, a, about a fourfold increased hazards for mortality. And if they have all three conditions, and some people are unfortunate to have this, for example, my father had diabetes, stroke, and a heart attack, uh, their risk is about sevenfold higher for mortality. But this is what really uh, uh, gives you the statistics that's important for patients is that if they have no diabetes and compare them to someone with diabetes age 60, they have six years of life years lost. If they have diabetes and cardiovascular disease, compared to who doesn't have those conditions, they lose 12 years of life uh, at the age of 60. So we have longevity is reduced uh, in people who have multiple long-term conditions. Physical activity or long-term conditions, and this is a study that we conducted showing that people, if they are at the bottom who are um, very physically active, at the top people who are um, inactive. If you look at that, the proportion of people who have uh, who are inactive uh, have about 50% have multiple long-term conditions. At the bottom, people who are active, about 20% have long-term conditions. And this is an older population. And as you can see, uh, there's a trajectory of increase in multiple long-term conditions if people are uh, not physically active, um, uh, uh, both in people who already had multiple long-term conditions and those who didn't. The red line is the average uh, increase in multiple long-term conditions at population level. This is a study that Yogini did uh, in our uh, group. We looked at uh, people with and without uh, multiple long-term conditions, multimorbidity, and we looked at to see if people are physically active, so they were uh, having uh, meeting the recommendations for uh, a physical activity about 150 minutes uh, per week of physical activity, mild to moderate physical activity. Then. Um, if um, they had high physical activity, so this is 3,000 minutes per week, if they're moderate physical activity, slightly lower, they have about uh, three and a half to three years of life's gain compared to those who are not physically active. 
And these are people with multiple long-term conditions. Uh, without multiple long-term conditions, if people are more active, they have about two years of life years gained at the age of 45. So at a younger age, it's important to ensure that people are physically active because there's a lot more life years to gain, particularly people with long-term, multiple long-term conditions. Um, this is uh, looking at uh, multiple long-term conditions of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and depression. And as we can see here, if people just had diabetes at the age of 45, people who are not active um, lose about two and a half years in life compared to those who are active. But if people at the age of 45 have two conditions, uh, for example, diabetes and cardiovascular disease, then they lose about six and a half years in life at the age of 45 compared to those who are active. And if they have three conditions, diabetes, cardiovascular disease and depression, they lose about eight and a half years in life years uh, at the age of 45 if they're not uh, physical activity, physically active compared to those who are active. So being active is associated with an increase in life expectancy. What about COVID-19 and impact on multiple long-term conditions? We know uh, from, a, again, our work with Yogini that uh, uh, cardiometabolic conditions, uh, including hypertension and diabetes, were the commonest conditions uh, people were affected with, either having uh, severe uh, uh, COVID-2 uh, and on the right-hand side, those who didn't uh, uh, COVID, uh, again, long-term conditions of cardiometabolic disease is more common. But if you look at the left-hand side, you know, people who had uh, diabetes and hypertension, they, about 72% of those uh, participants had severe COVID. And when we look at the risk of severe uh, COVID across the common conditions, uh, CKD and diabetes had the highest risk, about five-fold increased risk compared to those who didn't have these conditions, uh, and then heart failure, hypertension. Um, so you can see that diabetes is, again, a real risk factor uh, with the multiple long-term conditions for severe COVID. And once people were admitted, this is a data we've just published recently, once people are admitted, uh, they have more complications if they have more conditions. Um, so, uh, this is data for 60,000 people. Uh, any complications, if you have two conditions, you have twofold increased risk, more than two conditions, uh, threefold increased risk. All cause death, 22% higher, significantly higher in people with two or more conditions, and even higher with uh, more than uh, three conditions. But all other uh, secondary outcomes of being, getting these while admitted of heart failure, arrhythmia, cardiac ischemia, cardiac arrest, coagulation complications, stroke and renal injury, all much, much higher if people had multiple long-term conditions. So these people, even if they went in with just one condition, they will come out with uh, multiple long-term conditions. Management briefly, we have excellent uh, uh, consensus reports and guidelines that we should be managing these people with the, the therapies that have evidence base. So, for example, if they have heart failure, CKD, cardiovascular disease, then we should be thinking about SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists on the left-hand side. Uh, and then we need to think about all the other uh, potential uh, therapies if they don't have these. But remember, this is a very cardiocentric approach. We need to start thinking about microvascular complications now as well. We've seen decline in cardiovascular complications in people with diabetes, but microvascular complications are increasing, and we really need to uh, treat these people to reduce the risk. The other thing is the, the older people get, the more uh, conditions they have, they uh, have polypharmacy. So people who have more than uh, two conditions, they have uh, a, a lot more participants who have uh, polypharmacy. Uh, the number of drugs uh, thereon uh, increases. Um, if uh, uh, they have more uh, therapies, then obviously there's an increase for errors. So this is a study from uh, a number of countries showing that people who have two or more conditions have a much higher risk of medication errors. We know also polypharmacy is associated uh, with risk of falls. This is a, a study uh, that Nafisa conducted from our group. Um, so if people have more than five conditions, then their risk exponentially increases um, for increased risk of falls. 
So, for example, if the people are on, on six or more drugs, they have a 31% uh, significant increased risk of falls compared to those who are not on any drugs. If they're on 10 drugs, they have a 50% increased risk of falls. There's also complexity, and um, complexity raises uh, issues with adherence. So the more medications people are on, the less adherent they're on. So they'll have adverse events because people are not adherent. So this is uh, data showing if they're on one therapy, uh, they will be adherent 80% of the time, two therapies uh, adherent about 65% of the time, three therapies about 40% of the time. And uh, people with cardiometabolic multimorbidity, they're on a lot more therapies than that. So we need to start also thinking about quaternary prevention. This is where we de-intensify therapy because once people are elderly, we do not need these therapies uh, because there's, they're at harm uh, from risk of falls and hypoglycemia, as uh, we've mentioned. So this is a systematic review conducted by Sam Seydou in our group, 10 studies. And overall rates of de-intensification uh, ranged from about 13 to 75%. So we can safely de-intensify medications and there was no deterioration in HbA1c hypoglycemic episode falls or hospitalization de-intensification. So it's safe to stop therapies when appropriate to do so uh, when patients don't need these therapies. So we really need a holistic uh, individualized approach in managing people with multiple long-term conditions. We need to ensure lifestyle is optimized, as I've shown you. They need to be on early glucose lowering therapies, multiple risk factor uh, uh, control uh, with all the therapies that are uh, available. We need to avoid inertia and where appropriate, try and incorporate uh, the evidence-based therapies of SGLT2 inhibitors, so GLP receptor agonists in those with uh, established uh, or high risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, or heart failure. Because long-term, we want to reduce risk of microvascular and macrovascular complications and adding further multiple long-term conditions in these patients. So in summary, I think multimorbidity is now a norm for people. Uh, it contributes significantly to health inequalities and we need to now start thinking about how we can better support people with multiple long-term conditions. Rather than treating diabetes on its own, we need to manage people holistically rather than as a single entity. And we now know type 2 diabetes is occurring at a much younger age and patterns of multimorbidity will be changing. And so we start yeah, to think about uh, new uh, ways of working, multidisciplinary approaches on how to manage people with long-term conditions and prevent further clusters of multimorbidity occurring. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kamlesh. This was a recorded. I don't know whether Dr. Kamlesh is logged in for Q&As. Okay. I think we'll uh, move on to the last lecture of the session. And we have an excellent speaker with us, Dr. Sudeep Rudar. And uh, just a brief about Sudeep Rudar. Uh, he's a clinical endocrinologist at Life Forways Hospital in Johannesburg. He's an honorary consultant at the Charlotte Maxke Johannesburg Academic Hospital. He's the associate lecturer at the University of Witwatersrand in the field of internal medicine and endocrinology, and a student of philosophy at the Vedanta Academy in India. So over to Dr. Sandeep Rudar, and uh, he'll be addressing us today on uh, diabetes, the role of culture and ethnicity. So Dr. Rudar, to you. Um, thank you, Dr. Sanjay, and greetings from South Africa. I just want to confirm that you can hear me and see my slides on the screen. Yes, we can, no problem. Okay. Uh, thanks again for this opportunity. It's more of a personal interest talk and a little less academic uh, than the previous talks. Uh, it's a tough act to follow when you're speaking after Professor Kunti, who had the pleasure of meeting some time ago, and we discussed some of these issues over pizza in Rome. Um, the, the idea of this talk was uh, based on my personal experiences in a country where, um, you know, we have a high prevalence of diabetes and a multi-ethnic society. But the whole idea of lifestyle and culture is a topical one. So this talk is a little less physiological or pharmacological and a little more political and philosophical to uh, instigate thought and perhaps 
some action. It's a critical thinking piece more than anything else. So we've seen diabetes spread across the world. And, you know, when we were younger, 30, 40 years ago, we used to talk about diabetes as a Western pandemic. And uh, now it's spread across the world. And, and what I argue is that it's very prevalent in the so-called Eastern philosophical countries of the world, like China and India, where culture was a completely different idea to what we know today. What we call a Westernized culture is completely different from that. Now, this article um, is, a, is a commentary. It's a, a written in the Lancet, and I, and I would invite you to have a look at the details of the article, um, uh, uh, The Art of Medicine, looks at diabetes and race in the USA. And, and, and if you look at the history of diabetes since the late 19th century, it offers us uh, what we call a ca cautionary tale about how judgments about guilt and innocence and assumptions about whose bodies are civilized and whose are primitive can become baked into framing medical disease. The example is in the old days, um, minorities would suffer more diseases like infectious diseases like TB, uh, pneumonia, yellow fever, smallpox. So diabetes was seen in those days as a disease of civilized people and uh, cancer and heart disease were amongst those. And then when we started seeing diabetes um, increase in minority groups, uh, the allegation in the past, uh, uh, prior to that, was that uh, patients in minority groups with di uh, were immune to diabetes because they had a racial, alleged racial inferiority. But when that diabetes started presenting itself in ethnic groups or minority groups, then they went to theories of hunter-gatherer genes, suggesting that our bodies are more primitive. Now, this is not a judgment on anyone. I'm just giving you the history of things and how certain ideas can become embedded in our language of medicine. Because when you go through it then, and this is a nice summary taken out of a high impact journal, Nature Reviews Endocrinology, the top list is defined as non-reversible risk factors here. And I would argue that, look, older age genetics are certainly and family history are non-reversible risk factors. I think socioeconomic status is something we need to think about. It's something that is reversible in the long term, but uh, may take some time. And then to put non-white ancestry as a risk factor there, I understand where the scientific paradigm comes from, and I'll explain that in a, in a second. But when you start labeling being of an ethnic or origin other than Caucasian as a risk factor, there's an undertone which doesn't sit very well. There's something inferior about being born non-white. Um, and you got to look at the socioeconomic context in which disease happens. There may very well be some genetic differences, but what influences the expression of certain genetic risk is ultimately environment and our interaction with it. And these remain the most modifiable risk factors. And I think we don't give it as much attention as we need to because we tend to over biomedicalize a problem and purely look for pharmaceutical approaches. And I think that there's a balancing scale that needs to be looked at. So ethnicity is relating to large groups of people classed according to a common racial, common race, uh, racial, national, tribal, religious, or linguistic background. And the definition of culture I'll go through is something we need to look at very, very deeply. Because if we say modern culture is to do everything modern, and this is modern civilization, then I would ask the question, what do we mean by civilization? Is it not a more mature, objective way of life? Or is it simply that technology is advanced, so we got to take in everything? If everybody is drinking soft drinks, should we also drink soft drinks and just call it culture? It's a question that needs to be asked, and we need to investigate that properly. And they're disturbing numbers. I mean, you look all around the world where ethnic minorities exist. African Americans above the age of 20 years have higher rates of diabetes, of diagnosed and diagnosed. Uh, if you look at in America, the Latino Hispanic groups have higher rates of diabetes, fifth leading cause of death for Asian Americans in diabetes. And American Indians are 3.5 times higher, have a higher risk of diabetes related kidney failure. Now, in South Africa, here, we, our data is not great, but certainly in our national guidelines, it's the Asian and so called colored population. Colored is an unfortunate term we use in this country for people of mixed racial origin. And this is, this is from the old slave trade that occurred pre-apartheid era during those times where the mixings of certain populations and these uh, this group of people in especially the Cape area are called colored population. And we see in these mixed ethnicities higher prevalence of diabetes. 
And then when you look around the world as well, if you look at the prevalence of diabetes of ethnic groups um, living in the U.S. versus the countries of origin, once a certain ethnic group is in the United States, the rates of diabetes are higher. So certainly it's the environment playing a big role there, what we call a westernized culture. But then when you look at the prevalence of diabetes in various U.S. ethnic groups, I mean, you'll see that it's higher in the ethnic groups versus Caucasian population, suggesting that there may be a genetic predisposition in ethnic groups versus the Caucasians. And surely that needs to be investigated and understood better to develop better treatments or precision medicine. But then we're not emphasizing the lifestyle part. So the Western lifestyle being adopted and through migration has led to what we call, and I, I was interested in this word, acculturation. So a loss of a culture. And it's important to be aware of that. So this new lifestyle, what we call Westernized, is a diet of reduced fiber, increased consumption of animal fats and processed carbohydrates. We call it the Western diet. The problem I have with this is that we've so normalized it that all our studies and uh, you know, search for solutions to diabetes is still done in the context of a Westernized diet. And my question is, if a population has been aculturalized, then what was in the culture that worked for them to prevent diabetes? And why are we not investigating that and putting it into public health policy uh, more effectively and change this westernized diet then? Because if it's not working, why do we persist with it? And, and it's, it's a bugbear of mine because we see it in this country as well, which is why I got involved with more advocacy work in things like sugary drinks tax and food labeling, etc. And then socioeconomic factors continue to play a role. Minority groups around the world are marginalized. There's uh, racial and ethnic disparities, which affect socioeconomic factors. And then the actual stress of urbanization, migration, and belonging to a minority group. When you take a person out of a village, where they lived a very different type of culture in union with nature, where discussions with elders to resolve problems was a part of the culture. And you put them into a city where you're isolated, you have to fend for yourself, and the culture is competition and getting ahead. These patients experience a lot of stress. And we know that stress can physiologically increase risk of diabetes, uh, worsen outcomes, and indirectly through bad behavior modification can worsen or increase the risk of diabetes as well. And then it seems that ethnic groups, certain ethnic groups are more predisposed to obesity and that genetic predisposition is under study. But we do see, for example, in the Pima Indians that diabetes is occurring at younger, younger ages in certain minority groups. And that is diabetes without islet cell antibodies, normal insulin and C-peptide, suggesting a type 2 diabetes in younger and younger people. Um, so this is just a slide I've put up as an example. If you look at the traditional diet of Japanese, it was fish and vegetables until the end of the 19th century. And when they go into Los Angeles or um, other parts of the U.S., the succeeding generation of Japanese Americans changed from a traditional diet to diet containing may, many complements. So what happens, and we see it here too, people come from the village into the city, and then there's the snacks between meals, the soft drinks, uh, you know, constantly eating. We don't need to do that, and we should not culturalize that as normal. So obviously, higher fat, sugar, and sodium in calories in those diets. So if we're going to look at uh, how to approach diabetes in certain minority ethnic groups or ethnicity. Yes, the genetic factors need to be studied, and I'll just highlight that in the next few slides. Um, but on this side here, I think we need a revolutionary change into how we approach this part here, because what we need to do is we cannot go into this nutritionism where cultures have existed, understanding what a relationship with food means. We should be extracting that knowledge rather than turning it into an academic exercise and applying that knowledge to reverse diabetes. And perhaps those old cultures have knowledge on lifestyle that can be implemented in policy that governments can use rather than uh, a more academic. I think philosophy is necessary in medicine these days. And then obviously the combination of these two seems to lead to Truncal obesity and fat distribution, which seems to be the common pathway in ethnic groups that is at uh, higher prevalence, and then insulin resistance and beta cell dysfunction occurs, and we get this 
<clears throat> pandemic of what we now call diabetes, a combination of obesity and diabetes. And we see this and in terms of the genetic studies going on, and I'm sure uh, Professor Kunti has a lot more research on this, where you're starting to identify certain genes that increase the risk or odds ratio uh, of, of diabetes. And this will lead to later, perhaps more specific treatments or help us decide which of our existing treatments we can apply with better precision to our patients. But that's the pharmacological approach and it will continue. Um, for all the, the evidence that's been identified, the, the most common pathway seems to be still this positive energy balance, favorable adiposity genetic uh, alleles, which uh, favor weight gain around the belly. We see it amongst the South Indian population here in our area of Durban, uh, called KwaZulu-Natal, where Indians had migrated during the slave trade, and they have very high prevalence of diabetes and aggressive cardiovascular outcomes, uh, negative outcomes, which is seen in South India as well now, and I believe Professor V. Mohan is doing a lot of work in that space. But we got to look at the Eurocentric nature of these genetic studies. This is an actual quote taken from this article, and perhaps look at more individualized studies within our regions to understand these pathways better. Uh, this year is already known to most people. I mean, the colors here are a combination of the colors here on the palette. And what it's suggesting is that there's combinations of different issues like obesity, insulin action, insulin resistance, adipose to dysfunction, inflammation and fat distribution uh, and beta cell function in varying proportions in individuals that may play a role in the excessive risk of diabetes in certain ethnicities. And this should be studied more. Um, what you'd see here is that generally uh, Asian Indians tend to have more insulin resistance, less insulin sensitivity versus European Americans. And this may help us suggest that, you know, any intervention that helps with that aspect. There was a nice talk earlier showing how some of these molecules may have variants in, in effect. Uh, because of a, a predisposition to more insulin resistance. So we need to apply our minds when we're seeing our patients in terms of individualizing therapy according to uh, uh, the person in front of you, and perhaps genetic profiling and uh, uh, precision medicine in the future will be useful. So I've already highlighted the sort of approach in terms of the management of uh, patients with diabetes. I'm talking particularly about ethnic minorities now, uh, but this year it should be implemented early. We need to encourage our patients to perhaps even look at getting looking at getting back into a cultural type of diet. That, that simple advice that doesn't need a lot of resources, doesn't need a lot of uh, intervention. It's something they know already, something they understand, but the difficulty may be providing access within the new areas they're in. And, and that's something we need to think about. And beyond pharmacological intervention, we need to look at public health policies to reduce the um, discrepancies in socioeconomics, discrimination, access to care for ethnic minorities as well. Uh, last few slides are more political, philosophical commentary. Is We need to look at these kinds of models of uh, environmental exposures and social stresses in communities and, and tribal communities, when I say this or highlight this type of slide, is not suggesting we must go back to some tribal type of life, but we need to extract the information that is useful and apply it into modern civilization in a technologically advanced world. And that is possible. Take what is useful, reject what isn't, and make the rest your own. I think that is very important. Some of these uh, reviews have highlighted the social determinants of health and diabetes and everything from socioeconomic and political context to uh, social class, gender equality, ethnicity I've highlighted here, <clears throat> including housing, uh, sanitation, access to food, natural food. Um, these are the things that need to be addressed if we are going to curb the pandemic of diabetes across the world. It is no longer a disease of the West, of the effluent of Caucasian patients. It's not just more aggressive in ethnic minorities. It's a global problem that needs a global solution. And I don't think we must miss the opportunity to highlight the need for the introduction of a new culture, because it's the interaction of the human with the world that is critical in this pandemic. We are advancing very rapidly at the scientific level. Our guidelines are changing, consensus statements are changing based on new science. And unfortunately, in today's world, a lot of the science is driven by pharmaceutical in 
industries. There's very little independent science. So we have to play in this game, but we've got to maintain our independent objectivity and ask how we can use real culture to help human beings make better decisions in a world where it's difficult to make choices correctly. And that I think is very important. So to finish off in the last two or three minutes that I have left is the idea of culture and various definitions, ideas, customs, and social behavior. But the one that I got through my studies in India has been that culture it refers to a group of people living in a geographic region for a long period of time. But the critical part is respecting certain values of a higher life. And what are those values? Those are the values that help us choose better. This is the foods or nations of the past, natural food coming from our environments. And this is what it looks like today. And it's marketed to put pressure on people to buy the stuff through vanity and sensory gratification. We know that there is a design to these junk foods that uh, you know the companies have hired scientists and psychologists to create an addictive nature to these products. And these serve no higher value. They actually hurt human health at the end of the day. And then what happens is we go into this kind of nutritionism where we create products through scientific understanding of what food ought to be, but that doesn't help because, you know, one year you hear less fat, the other year you hear less carbs, but inculcating an objective relationship with just food that comes from nature and improving agriculture and those practices may be the solution ultimately. Uh, we have become very sedentary and, and is this evolution or not? And uh, how do we activate people? Uh, uh, Professor Kunti just showed that being active can add a few years to your life. For the sake of time, I won't go through this whole narrative, but the, this, this was a, a story written by a tribal ancestor in the, in the USA. And he's highlighting we used to grow our food. Now, of course, times have changed, but certainly we could get our farmers to assist with perhaps a more natural food. In the last two and a half minutes, this is a sensitive slide. These are the actual pictures of slaves brought from India to South Africa to work on the sugarcane plantations, which served the colonizers in the UK uh, who couldn't grow the sugarcane in the country because the climate wasn't conducive and African slaves brought. Now, prior to this, diabetes was not known in these groups. These people worked on the sugarcane plantations that helped the Lord's make a profit. And that same sugar industry, unfortunately, exists in the corporate world now as the junk food industry, which we don't call out. We've culturalized that Western life as normal. And our people are now suffering from diabetes, having incorporated that as a normal culture. It's a big philosophical question, and we must not acclimatize to it. So, Ultimately, to get to a better level, I think we need to look at a question in medicine on the fundamental values of life, value systems, where work with an unselfish attitude, uh, which is not just about a corporate type of approach for productivity and profit that serves a human need. We need collective direction as a species on the globe in our individual countries. Objectivity is necessary. Um, working to duties and not just selfish rights, giving and not taking, understanding that the universe and nature has given us enough to have a healthy life and we just need to perhaps simplify is a discussion that needs to be had. These values were no more better uh, practiced than some great humans here on the slide who had interactions with India and South Africa as Mahatma Gandhi and Nelson Mandela and uh, depicted as very lean and healthy, I might add. And I think this discussion is very necessary if we are to curb not just diabetes in minority groups and different ethnic groups, but as a humanity uh, in, on this globe. Ubuntu is an African philosophy of I am because you are, and it's something that definitely, I think, uh, uh, needs some investigation. So beyond our science for the body with evidence-based medicine and precision medicine, and beyond policies which regulate the do's and don'ts like taxation, my summary for this talk is if we are to deal with diabetes in our groups, then we need to aim to help humans develop self-efficacy, self-sufficiency, self-actualization, a conversation not happening as, uh, uh, as, uh, as it should in terms of the proportion of it. And I'll leave you with this final slide, which is a quote from the great Swami Ramatirtha, who was a philosopher and mathematician in the 1800s. And uh, I'll leave that for you to read. The facts and figures are merely trickery, fables and fictions. 
is mere gossamer. Let's go inward to our own knowledge systems and let's use that to develop a new narrative to change the trajectory of diabetes. I hope this has uh, encouraged some critical thinking for you, sometimes deemed controversial, but I think it's a need of the hour. And from here, we can work on solutions. I thank you for the platform. Thank you so much, Dr. Sudeep. I think these were uh, three absolutely outstanding, thought-provoking, state-of-the-art lectures. Uh, we are extremely thankful to Dr. Lezek, uh, Dr. Kamlesh Kunti, and Dr. Sudeep for very thought-provoking and uh, inspiring talks. Uh, I think I have one question for Lezek, uh, Dr. Lezek, if he's still around. Okay, can't. Okay, so in that case, no, uh, he's there. Let's check. Is there? You just ask. I, I'm sure he will uh, unmute himself. <laughs>